Basic medical scientists, welcome. In this video, we are going to talk about articulations between the bones of the trunk, that's the whole vertebral column. We'll talk about the articulations between the vertebral column and the skull, the articulations between the ribs and the sternum, and then we'll conclude by talking about the uh, thoracic cage as a whole. Right, so... Um, you know, uh, from now onwards, you're going to see some ads on my videos, right? Please, can you just watch even for for at least 30 seconds? I will really appreciate that. That's how I'm going to buy coffee, right? Okay, so let's continue. Uh, starting with the articulations between the vertebrae, right? So uh, the human vertebral column has all types of articulations, including syndesmosis, that's the ligaments between the transverse and spinous processes, synelastosis, that's ligaments between the vertebral arches, synchondrosis, that's uh, between the bodies of a series of vertebrae, right? synchondrosis is cartilage, you remember, synostosis, that's uh, between the sacral vertebrae, right, so um, in young people, like uh, the, the sacral vertebrae are separate, but as time goes on, they will fuse into a single bone, that's uh, sacrum, right? Hemiarthrosis, that's uh, between the bodies of a series of vertebrae. Diarthrosis, these are true joints between the articular processes. So as a result, uh, the articulations between the vertebrae may be divided according to their paths into articulations between the vertebral bodies, articulations between the vertebral arches, articulations between the processes, right? So let's start with articulation between the vertebral bodies, right? So the vertebral bodies forming the vertebral column proper, which support the trunk, unite, in, uh, unite one with another, and also with the sacrum by means of synchondrosis, right? So this is uh, uh, through uh, intervertebral cartilages or intervertebral discs, uh, Latin name, uh, discs intervertebrales, discs intervertebrales, and also the uh, hemiarthrosis if there is a cleft between them, right? So uh, let's talk more about this intervertebral disc, like the structure of the uh, vertebral disc, Right, so it looks like this. Each disc is a fibrocartilaginous plate, uh, which consists of two parts. The first one is the peripheral fibrous ring, that's annulus fibrosus, right? It's a layer of connective tissue. Uh, you can see here, right? So you can see the layers of connective tissue around here. And uh, the gelatinous nucleus, that's the inner part, this one. Uh, on the center, right? So this is a soft fibrous cartilage, right? Soft fibrous cartilage, right? So this uh, uh, nucleus pulposus is uh, actually a remnant of notochords in, in, in vertebrae, right? It's a remnant of notochord, right? The intervertebral disc correspond to the vertebral bodies in shape, but are somewhat wider and protrude consequently over the edges of vertebral bodies as swellings. The discs are thickest where mobility is uh, greatest, that is in the lumbar region and the least thick between the thoracic vertebrae, right, because there is less mobility there, right. Uh, the Column of vertebral bodies unite by the intervertebral discs is reinforced by two longitudinal ligaments, one on the front and another one on the back, right? So uh, the first one is called the anterior longitudinal ligament, that's ligamentum longitudinale anterius, right? So this ligament I will show you, uh, it prevents abnormal backward extension of the spine. The second one, the posterior longitudinal ligament, ligamentum longitudinale posteriors. This ligament uh, extends from the second cervical vertebrae downwards 
on the posterior surface of the uh, vertebral bodies uh, in the vertebral canal to the upper end of the sacral canal. The function of this ligament is uh, hindering flexion, right? So it hinders flexion and is a functional antagonist of the anterior longitudinal ligament, right? Let me show you these two ligaments, right? Okay, so this is the uh, anterior view and this is the lateral view, right? So anteriorly, you can see uh, this ligament. That's the anterior longitudinal ligament, this one. This is the... Um, posterior longitudinal ligament and here you can see it here right that's the posterior anterior is here is very easy to recognize right other ligaments we'll talk about them later right second one articulations between the uh, vertebral arches right so the space between the arches are filled by elastic fibers of yellow color which are therefore called yellow ligaments or ligamenta flava right so you can see here right so this is the uh, anterior view you can see the um, anterior longitudinal ligament here right so on this other part we've removed the body so that you can see you re we removed the two uh, vertebral bodies here so you can see arches this one uh, vertebral arch arcus uh, vertebralis and in between you see the yellow ligament Ligamenta flava, yellow ligaments, ligamenta flava. Because of their elasticity, they tend to bring the arches closer to each other and together with the resilience of the intervertebral cartilages, they contribute to a straight spine and upright position. Next, the articulations between the vertebral processes Right, so these are divided into uh, union between the articular processes, union between the uh, spinous processes and between the transverse processes. Let's start with um, union between the articular processes, right? So these are actually joints, true joints. They are called what? Uh, intervertebral joints, Latin name, uh, articulationes, intervertebrales or articulaciones zigapophysiales articulaciones not are but articulaciones zigapophysiales right so you can uh, if you can see here right this is the um, uh, cervical spine right so look at uh, between union between c4 and c3 Right. You can see the inferior articular process of C3 articulating with the superior um, process of C4. Right. That's the uh, intervertebral joints. Right. So what are the characteristics of these joints? Number one, the intervertebral joints are combined joints. Right. Because they function to, uh, simultaneously. Right. This one and this one. That's uh, the right and left. They function simultaneously. These are multi-axial, plane, and tight joints. The articular surfaces of these joints are almost flat, uh, and they can be regarded as the surfaces of a sphere with a very large radius. They consequently allow movement in all the three axes, but the range of movement is small because the articular surfaces differ uh, only slightly, right? Next, the spinous processes, right? So the between the spinous processes, between the two is inter, right? So you have interspinous ligaments, ligamenta interspinalia, right? So these are found between uh, the uh, spinous processes. The interspinous ligaments are developed most markedly in the lumbar region. Right. So uh, on top, like on the apex of the uh, spinous processes, you find the supraspinous ligament. Right. So this is a roundish bend continuous with the interspinous ligaments 
at the back and it stretches over the apices, right? Apices from apex of the spinal process. In the cervical parts of the spine, the interspinous ligaments stretch beyond the apices of the spinous process and form a very important ligament. Uh, it's a sagittal nuchal ligament. Uh, ligamentum nuchae, right? The nuchal ligament, right? The nuchal ligament is actually triangular. One of its, side is, uh, its sides is attached to the uh, spinous processes. Another extends uh, to the external occipital protuberance, while the third side is free, right? So it's a free side that stretches from uh, C7 to the external occipital protuberance, making a triangle, right? So in men who walks upright, it is less pronounced, right? So together with the interspinous uh, and supraspinous ligaments, this uh, ligament, a nuchal ligament, together with these two, hinders the excessive forward deflection of the spine and head, right? So the nuchal ligament is mostly developed in, um, in, in four-legged animals, right? Okay. So here you can see between the spine, all right, orientation first. This is the anterior side and this is the posterior side, right? So these are the spinous processes. Between the spinous processes, you find the interspinous ligament, right? Interspinous ligament. And on the apex here, you find the supraspinous ligament, the supraspinous ligament. Right, and going up towards uh, like uh, from the external occipital protuberance to the apex of C7, that's where you find the what the nuchal ligament. You can see it here, right? The, that's the nuchal uh, ligament, right? But you know, in other people, you can actually see this ligament, for example, here you can see in this woman, you can see the uh, nuchal ligament here, okay. Perfect. Next, uh, the union between the transverse processes, right? So uh, transverse processes are articulated by the intertransverse ligaments, ligamenta intertransversaria, right? So, um, okay, so let me give you orientation, right? So this is the vertebra, right? So above on these three, we have removed the three bodies, right? So uh, these are transverse processes on the sides. These are transverse processes. And this and this, these are arches, right? Arches, right? So uh, to remind you, between the uh, vertebral arches, you find the yellow ligament, ligamenta flava, right? Yellow ligaments, ligamenta flava, right? So between the transverse processes here, you find the intertransverse ligaments, ligamenta intertransversaria. The intertransverse ligaments limit the lateral movements of the spine to the contralateral side. That's the main function, limiting the lateral movements of the spine to the contralateral side. Right. Next, uh, we need to talk about the union between the vertebral column and the skull. So the union between the... Um, the vertebral column and the skull, there is the atlanto occipital joint, the joint between the what? Uh, the occipital bone and the atlas, right? So the, these are uh, united by means of two right and left atlanto occipital joints, articulationes atlanto occipitalis, right? Uh, the atlanto occipital joints. Articulatio atlanto occipitalis. So there are two, uh, left and right. Each atlanto occipital joint is a condyloid joint. They are formed by the condyles of the occipital bone, the occipital condyles, uh, condyle occipitalis, and the concave surface uh, this is, is actually the superior articular surface of the atlas, right? So it is uh, like a Concave is like a fovea. Latin name is called 
uh, fovea articularis uh, superioris atlantis. Right, so if you look here, right, this is the occipital bone, right, these are the occipital condyles, and this is the atlas, right, so in between, that's where you find the atlanto occipital joint here and here, right. So both pairs of the articulating surfaces are enclosed in a separate articular capsules, but they move simultaneously forming a single combined joint. The auxiliary ligaments, right? The first one is the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane, membrana atlanto-occipitalis anterior, right? So this membrane stretches between the anterior arch uh, of the atlas and the occipital bone, okay? So if you look here, right? This is the anterior view. So this is C1. That's the atlas and the occipital bone in between. That's where you find the uh, this anterior atlanto occipital membrane here. On the posterior side, there is a posterior atlanto occipital membrane, membrana atlanto occipitalis posterior. This membrane stretches uh, between the posterior arch of the atlas and the posterior margin of the foramen magnum. The big foramen right so uh, this is the posterior view you can see this this is the membrane i am talking about uh, posterior atlanto occipital membrane membrana atlanto occipitalis posterior right so uh, on the sides you can actually see the capsule of the atlanto occipital joint here and here okay uh, what are the movements at this joint? Movements in the atlanto occipital joints. So this joint allow movements on two axes in the frontal and sagittal axes. First one is nodding like this. If you're agreeing, right? That's uh, bending the head forwards and backwards in a sign of ascent, okay? And it takes place in the frontal axis. And the uh, lateral bending of the head to the left and to the right, right? And also uh, abduction and adduction. Okay, so from this position, abduction and adduction, right? So, so these are uh, these movements, like and this one, they take place in the sagittal axis. The atlas and the axis, right? Uh, the C1 and C2 respectively, they unite uh, by means of three combined joints, the atlanto axial joints, right? You have two lateral and, and one median, right? Lateral atlanto axial joints, articulationes atlanto axialis lateralis. These joints are formed by the inferior articular surface of the atlas and the superior articular surface of the axis, right? Latin name, uh, fovea articularis inferioris atlantis and thesis articularis superior axis right this is a typo so if you look here uh, this is the atlas and this is the axis in between that's where you find the aa joint right that's the lat lateral atlanto axial joints right these joints are combined plane joints all right. The next is the median atlanto axial joint. Right. So articulationes atlanto axialis mediana. So the median atlanto axial joint is formed by the odontoid process, thus dense axis, the facet of the dense on the anterior arch of the atlas is called fovea dentis, and the transverse ligament of the atlas ligamentum transversum atlantis, right? So this ligament is stretches between the inner surfaces of the lateral masses. If you remember the structure of uh, the vertebrae, right? They are lateral masses in, in C1, right? C1 is the one which doesn't have the body, if you remember. You can uh, click the link on the top right corner and watch the uh, structure of vertebrae, right? Typical vertebrae. Okay.
So uh, this is the median atlanto axial joint. This is the um, arch of C1 and it is a fovea and on that fovea that's where you find the dense of C2 right and this is the membrane right the dense is therefore enclosed in a osteofibrous ring osteofibrous ring because osteo there is a bone this side and fibrous because there is a, this ligament right uh, as a result, this kind of joint is called a, what, a trochoid joint or pivotal joint, right? And we used this specific uh, joint as an example in trochoid joints. The axillary ligaments. The first one is the cruciate ligament of the atlas, ligamentum cruciforme atlantis, right? This ligament consists of uh, the following. The transverse ligament of the atlas, ligamentum transversum atlantis. Right, so this is the transverse ligament. This one, that's the transverse ligament. It stretches between the inner surfaces of the lateral masses of the atlas. Then uh, there is a longitudinal band of a cruciate ligament, fasciculus longitudinalis ligament, uh, cruciformi atlantis. It's a long name, right? But this is this ligament, right? This, and it has two parts. The upper part and the lower part. This upper part is called the superior longitudinal band of cruciform ligament. And this one is the inferior longitudinal band of the cruciform ligament. Right, so this cruciform ligament is very important. It prevents dislocation of the dance which might injure the spinal cord or the medulla oblongata which is located or enclosed in the foramen magna. And that condition is very fatal. Right. Uh, number two, there is the apical ligament of the ordinoid process. Ligamentum apicis dentis. Right. So this ligament extends from the tip of the dens to the anterior edge of foramen magnum. Right. So um, if you look here, this is the dens from the apex. You see, there is this straight ligament here, the apical ligament, right? That's ligamentum apicis dentis. The next one, we have our ala ligaments, ala like wings, right? So the ala ligaments of the ordinary process is called a ligamenta alaria, right? So these are the ala ligaments uh, here, right, on the sides. They pass from the lateral surface of the dense and they are attached to the medial surface of the condyles of the occipital bone. Right. And this is another view. Right. You can see the dens here. You can see your transverse uh, ligament here. Right. Tra transverse ligament is part of the uh, uh, cruciform ligament. Right. And you can see the ala ligaments here going this direction. This whole apparatus of ligaments, which we just described, uh, is covered posteriorly from the aspect of the vertebral canal by the tectorial membrane, membrana tectoria, right, which stretches from the anterior edge of the foramen magnum uh, to the body of the second cervical vertebrae. Right? And this membrane is continuous with the posterior longitudinal ligament of the spine, which we just talked about. We said it's inside the vertebral collar, right? And it's, it functions like um, as an antagonist to the anterior longitudinal ligament. What are the movements in the atlantoaxial joints? The atlantoaxial joints permit only a single type of movement, thus rotation of the head in the vertical axis, thus turning to the right and left, if you are expressing that you don't agree, you are disagreeing, right? Passing through the dens of the axis vertebra, the head moves around the dens together with the atlas, thus the trochoid, okay? So you can see here, this is fixed, right? But this, uh, I mean, this movement is turning around this atlas and the whole head, it will be turning around on the fixed position, 
the movements occur at the same time as the lateral atlantoaxial joints. And uh, these joints are plane joints and they allow movement on three axes, but the range of movement is small, right? It's like a slight gliding movement because the articular surfaces differ uh, only slightly. A wider range of movement of the head is usually produced with the participation of the whole cervical part of the spine. Now let's look at the uh, vertebral column as a whole. The spine of the newborn is almost straight and the curvatures, which I'm going to talk about later, they are, uh, they are hardly formed. When the infant begins to raise his head, a curvature forms in the neck and the head, whose greatest part is held in front of the spine, all right, like this. All right, so the baby will, turn, will, will be bending down like this. So to hold the head raised like this, the spine curves forward and the child's repeated attempts to raise the head and hold it in that position by contraction of the posterior muscles of the head facilitated the formation of the curvature. As a result, the cervical lordosis uh right so this is uh when the baby is attempting to raise his head right that's the formation of the cervical lordosis when a sitting posture is adopted right when the child attempts to sit the thoracic uh, kinphosis increases right you see this one thoracic kinphosis and uh, later, when the child learns to stand and walk, there will be the lumbar lordosis. Right? Okay, let me show you these things like in a, in a mature uh, vertebral column. Right, so the curvature anteriorly is convex and is called lordosis. And the curvature posteriorly is convex and is called kyphosis. Right, uh, sometimes there is a lateral uh, coverage is called the uh, scoliosis like right? uh, it's mainly in uh, uh, school children like the sitting position right okay so this is what it looks like right so you can see the cervical lordosis right and this is the anterior side and this is the posterior side okay so cervical lordosis the thoracic uh, kyphosis the lumbar lordosis and you can see the sacral uh, forces here down there okay so let let's look at some changes uh, as the, the person grows right so at old age the spine loses its curvatures because of the diminution of the vertebral disc and losing the elasticity the spine will bend forward forming a single big curvature called the uh, this hump is called a senile hump bag or senile kyphosis. The vertebral column will become short and you know the length can be uh, reduced by five to six centimeters. All right. So uh, if you look here, you can see this uh senile humbag, right? Or senile kyphosis. Right. The movements of the vertebral column as a whole, right? So the, this, these are the five main movements, right? Movement in the frontal axis, that's a flexion, forward angle of 160 degrees and extension, that's backward uh, to an angle of 145 degrees. The next one is the sagittal axis, right? So in the sagittal axis, there is abduction and adduction, that's bending to the right and left with a common amplitude of 165 degrees on vertical axis there's a rotation of the trunk that's turning to the right and to the left with a common amplitude of 120 degrees circumduction right from one axis to another is also positive and the spring movements that that will be the elongation and shortening of the spine through an increase or diminution of the spinal curvatures in constriction or relaxation 
of the corresponding muscles okay fine now you can take a short break and then come back later we will talk about uh, the articulations in the uh, thorax right so your short break is here welcome back All right so let's talk about the joints of the ribs All right so the first firstly we'll talk about the joints between the ribs and the sternum Right, between the ribs and the sternum, right? If you remember, the sternum is uh, the three parts, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. And the ribs, the ribs have a bone part and the uh, cartilaginous part. And we said the cartilaginous part is the one which articulates uh, with the sternum, right? So the first seven ribs, called uh, true ribs, articulates directly with the sternum by the means of Sternocostal joints, sternocostal joints, articulationes sternocostalis. Only the cartilages of the first rib fuses directly with the sternum by means of synchondrosis. The false ribs, like from 8, 9, and 10, is connected by the anterior end of its cartilage to the inferior border of the cartilage of the rib above it by interchondral joints, articulationes interchondrales, right? And they have a capsule, right? It's called what? Uh, perichondrium. So let's have a closer look on the sternocostal joints, right? So the sternocostal joints are found by the anterior end of the cartilage of the true ribs. And the costal notches, incisura costalis on the lateral border of the sternal body of the sternal body here the costal notch of the second rib coincides with the junction between the manubrium and the body of the sternum right so this is the junction right and um, this is where this angle is is called the sternal angle or the angle of louis right next the joints of the ribs and vertebrae, right, on the back. The ribs articulate with the thoracic vertebrae by means of two combined joints, right? They are called a costal uh, vertebral joints, articulationes costal vertebrales. So these joints are divided into two. The joints of the heads of the ribs, articulationes capitis costae, and the Costo transverse joints, articulationes, costo transversari. Right, so let's look at the first one, the joints of the heads of the ribs, right? Articulationes, capitis. This is capitis costa, not apitis. Right, so uh, the joints of the heads of the ribs are formed by the articular facets on the heads of the ribs and the fovea costalis on the thoracic vertebrae, right? So this is the joint I am talking about, the joint of the head of the rib here. And if you look here, the this will be the costal transverse joint, right? This will be the articulation with the, the transverse process, right? And it's here, right? Because this is the tra these are the transverse process. This one is called costal transverse joint. This one. The facets on the head from the second rib to the uh, tenth rib are articulated with the fovea costalis of the two adjacent vertebrae, the one above and below. Right. Only the head of the first, eleventh, and the twelfth uh, ribs are articulated with the whole fovea costalis of the body of the corresponding vertebrae. Right. So uh, again, let's just say uh, from from the second rib to the uh, tenth rib, they uh, articulates with uh, we can say they articulates with um, uh, two vertebral bodies, right? The the uh, the fovea on the lower and on the upper, right? But number one, eleven and twelve, they articulate with corresponding uh, vertebrae. Right, so the first rib articulates directly with the T1, only T1, 
right? And 11 and 12th rib is the same situation. Right. Next is the costal transverse joints, articulationes costal transversari, right? So uh, these are found between the tubercles of the ribs and the articular faces on the transverse processes. The last two ribs, that's the 11th and 12th ribs, they do not have these joints. They do not have the uh, costal transverse joints. The movements in the costal vertebral joints. Both articulations of the ribs with the vertebrae function as a single combined pivotal joint with the pivotal axis passing through uh, the neck of the rib. The ligaments, right? So these are the important ligaments on these joints, which are on the joints which I just mentioned, right? So this one is the articulation between the head of the rib and the uh, board of the uh, thoracic vertebrae, right? So this joint is called uh, articulatio capitis costae. This one, articulation with the transverse process, is called uh, articulatio costo transversaria, right? So this is the rib, right? And this is part of the, this is the uh, thoracic vertebrae. So when this rib and this thoracic vertebrae, um, uh, after articulation, there is formation of this foramen, it's called foramen costo transversarium. This one, foramen costo transversarium, right? So this one is usually covered with this ligament, ligamentum or costo transversarium. This one, right? And then uh, on this joint of the head of the rib, articulatio capitis coste, there is um this ligament, ligamentum capitis coste intra-articulare, right? So there's an intra-articular ligam ligament and also the uh, radiate ligaments here. Uh, ligamentum capitis coste radiatum. Right, so if you look here, these are the other joints, right? So uh, this one is called articulatio zigapophysialis, right? That's the um, the real intervertebral joints, right? And if you look here, this will be the um, superior articular process of uh, T8 and this one will be the inferior articular process of T7, right? It's just, it's just a superior view, right? Okay, I need to show you another ligament here. This ligament is called uh, the costal transverse ligament, the lateral one, ligamentum costal transversarium laterally. Right. And here you can see it in full. Ligamentum costo transversarium laterale. This one. And this one covering the costo transverse uh, foramen is called ligamentum costo transversarium. Here, if you look, uh, there is an intra articular uh, uh, ligament. Right. Ligamentum capitis coste intra articulare. Right. And then outside there is radiate ligament. Uh, ligamentum capitis coste radiatum. This one. Okay. Uh, let's look at the thoracic cage as a whole. Right. So, uh, if you look, this is the whole thoracic um, thoracic cage. There is an upper opening and lower opening. This one is the, called the superior aperture, and downwards is the inferior aperture. And this angle is called uh, the um what else right so you just need to know uh like what forms the thoracic cage as a whole you can see from t1 to t12 right and then you will find the ribs from the first to the 12th and if you remember you need to remember the classification right the classification of ribs the true ribs false ribs and floating rib and uh what else the two parts of the sternum Right, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. Right, okay. And here you can see um, the joints, right? So the joints we talked about there, but you need to see the ligaments. Right, so let's start with the, uh, these joints. Right, so these are the um, sternocostal joints, right? Sternocostal joints, they are actually joints because you, inside you see the articular cavities right 
and inside there is an um, a ligament intraarticular stenocostal ligament here you can see it here all right and then okay let's start from here right so uh, this is the this is the jugular notch jugular notch right and on this on top here you can see the interclavicular ligament interclavicular ligament you can see uh, these ligaments are called radiate stenocostal ligaments radiate stenocostal ligaments right so this other part about the clavic we'll talk about it in the bones of the lower limb which is going to be our next video right so stay tuned <laughs>